Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I'm your host, Jimmy Erdwin. You might be asking, wait a second, it's daylight. It's not evening. Well, we're not live this week. We have the great fortune of being at the Houston Forensic Science Center to go inside and take a look at how they examine firearms. We're even going to get a look at how they test fire a firearm. So let's go inside and start the program. Here we are, we're inside, and we're gonna be talking about my favorite subject today, firearms and the forensics behind them. We're gonna be joined by Dr. Peter Stout. Dr. Stout, good to see you. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming back on oh, the program. Glad to be here, appreciate it. Um, so where are we right now? So right now we're in the lobby of the 1200 Travis Building, which is the headquarters of HPD, and this is a little police museum that they've got at the bottom. So we see various yep. items from HPD's history, but wait a second, yep. I thought you guys wanted to be out of HPDs. That is building. what we're working on trying to do. <laughs> and yeah. how long do you expect for that to take? I am hoping that we actually, we've got a couple of options on new facility that we're talking about. Um, and I'm really hoping that we can get out of this building and into a single facility within the next two to three years. Nice, well, in the meantime, you know, I came here to talk about firearms and um, forensics behind them with you and your staff. Talking on firearms, why don't we go up and take a look at the lab? That'd be great, that's what we want. All right. All right. Yeah, come on in, we're waiting for... So this elevator is known as Pokey. It doesn't like to close its doors. <laughs> <laughs> we're laughing about the elevator. I know that this is... Now, are you guys on just on one floor? Well, oh, yeah. How's that work? Laboratory facility is a real challenge for us. We are actually on 11 different floors in four different buildings. Okay. So there's 24 floors in this building. Yep. And how many are you in this building? We are in five different floors in this building. Okay, and where are the other buildings? So there's another building that's just about three blocks away from here on Fannin Street. There we've got the latent print uh, examiners, uh, digital and multimedia evidence, and some of our administrative functions are over in that building. We've got a building that's over on Dart Street where we process vehicles as evidence as part of crime scene. And then we've got another uh, building that's close to Dart Street that is where we deal with uh, training of crime scene technicians and some stuff with crime scene. Gotcha. Now last episode we were talking about rape kits mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. Where are those? So are biology, yeah, biology's in this building. Okay. So in this building we've got toxicology, biology, um, controlled substances, seized drugs. Uh, firearms, which is where we're headed. Gotcha. Um, and then there's some administrative functions in here. Crime scene is on a couple of different floors in this building. So we've got groups that are spread between floors, even within groups. We have parts of the facility where we are stacked on top of each other okay. and parts that we just can't use. It's the best of all worlds. So this is where the magic happens back yep. here. So, firearm section. That's what I came for. Yep. Hey, Donna. Hey. We're here, cameras included. Hey. <laughs> so, all right, so where are we heading now? All right, so firearms, I think the place we were gonna start with this was down uh, kind of at the start of the process, and we'll get Max, one of our Niven techs, to walk you through so some of the process. Stuff off the wall. Um, we get about 400-ish requests a month. Wow. For processing weapons into the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, or NIBIN, which is the database to compare weapons. Uh, out of that, we probably get about 300 odd weapons themselves. Um, and then we have about 20 ish uh, forensic examinations. Now, of the weapons, weapons themselves aren't stored here, right? Yeah, we have weapons that are stored here. We do. Okay. Um, so what, what we have that's in process is what we store here. Gotcha. So. There's the property, HPD's property room, right. that evidence goes through that. We bring evidence over to our facilities that we're actively in the process of working, and then it goes back to HPD's property room. Okay. So we've got um, evidentiary weapons, which we won't shoot those, but we've got a reference collection of weapons. We've got about... When you say you won't shoot them, you mean you won't test fire won't, them? Won't, no, don't film the evidence weapons, because we've got case numbers and things gotcha. like that on the evidence weapons. But... Um, so we've got a reference collection that we keep in here, mm -hmm. about 1,400 weapons that are long guns and handguns in the file cabinets. We have those for to use as examples in court or for spare parts or for training purposes um, as we train you know, our personnel on the handling of different types of weapons. Um, and then we've got evidentiary weapons that are in the process of being test fired, examined, all of those types of things. So what's the type of thing that you would want to teach one of your employees when it comes to 
first steps in learning about a weapon? Well, so certainly safe handling. Um, right. But mo most of the people that come to us have, you know, a firearms background. They're, they're either a shooter themselves or some military or other things where they've had some weapons experience. Um, but there is a wide variety of firearms, um, handling of those. And our firearms examiners are kind of part armor, part forensic scientist, because in test firing weapons, oftentimes we get weapons that we have to uh, actually make them functional mm -hmm. because they will have come out of you know a canal or they're rusted or not actually very many people take care of their firearms very yeah. well. Imagine that. Uh, imagine that. <laughs> so we have to make them functional, which means we've got to find parts for some of them. They've got to work through that uh, to make them functional. Um, then there's a lot of training that goes into in fire war firearms, all of the different what we call class characteristics, mm -hmm. caliber, um, how it's uh, chambered for what type of ammunition. The and I see a wide of, variety of. <laughs> we've got a wide variety of some, long guns. Some going back very yeah. very long. Yeah, we've got so a, again these are all. And all firearms units have what they call a reference collection like mm -hmm. this, that they're, you know, a variety of weapons that are some are of interest, some are kind of... I, mean, I see like a Tommy gun yep. up here. Yeah, I, th I think all firearms units have, it's, it's an obligatory thing right. for firearms to yeah. have a Tommy gun someplace. <laughs> they, they all have to have one. Um, and these are all the long rifles. These are all long guns here. Do you, have, do you also keep handguns Yeah, we've, we've got handguns that we have, so all of these, all of these file cabinets are filled with various types of handguns. Revolvers, um, revolvers, semi-automatics, semi automatics. Yeah, there's an Uzi in here someplace. Really? Um, Man, there's is, all kinds this of is stuff. A collector's dream, right here. Yeah, it's a little bit of a collector's dream. But again, <laughs> why we've got these is training purposes and sure. examples. Uh, you know, oftentimes in court, somebody is talking about you know a particular type of you know, lever action weapon, but they don't actually have the weapon from that case. So we can have an example of this is what a lever action long gun would look like, this is how it works, the various types of things of how it would function. And how often is it, I mean, in today, in, in a case today where there's a shooting, mm -hmm. um, that you might need to reference an older gun? I mean, does that happen often? Or, yeah, that's, or that would probably be a good question for Don or one of the firearms folks. Yeah. Remember, toxicologist. Mm -hmm. um, right. But, uh, you know, there's, there's regular cause to deal with the kinds of weapons that are out there. Actually, I think they just had a hit I'm going to ask her whether the or not other day. we've ever had a, yeah, I don't, a, a Tommy gun. I don't think they've ever had to use the Tommy gun. <laughs> used recently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they had a hit the other day of a weapon that was in a, using a crime here just recently that linked back to uh, another crime from 2004. Wow. All right, so you're telling us about a hit. What is a hit? So a hit is where we're comparing a weapon against the database, and we've got a return from the database. It's, it's a little like CODIS for guns, or APHIS, which is for fingerprints that that gun matches something in the database. Is there a way we can see that process go on? Yeah, why don't we go down the hall here and uh, one of our technicians can walk you through the process. Right. Now, how many technicians do you have? So we have 10 firearms examiners, uh, which is a large firearm section. Right here? Yeah, in here. Here we go. Where'd Joe be at So we're here with Joe Perrion, and Joe is an Ivan Tech here at the Houston Forensic Science Center. Joe, thanks for joining us. No problem. Um, explain a little bit, first off, what is NIBIN? NIBIN is the uh, National Integrated Ballistics Information Network. It's run by the ATF. It's a database pretty much similar to what CODIS is, but it's for firearms. And so what's your role here uh, as, a, as a tech? <laughs> My role as a tech is I will we will receive guns in for NIBIN work. Essentially what I'll do is I will check the uh, functionality and um, what type of firearm it is, and I will write all the important information down as well as test fire and submit the test fires into the NIBIN system. Can you walk us through the whole process? Sure. That'd be great. Excuse me, I'm sorry. So what are we starting with now? Uh, I we seem to have some uh, semi-automatic rifles here. Yeah, I grabbed a bunch of semi-automatic <laughs> rifles for you guys today. Uh, so we'll start with this one. It's like an AR. Uh, it does look like an AR. This is a, let me see where it is. This is an Aero Precision, um, brand rifle, it's a model X15. It says multi-caliber, usually the caliber, when they say that, is located on the barrel underneath this uh, barrel guard, and it has a specific serial number to the specific gun. Now, is this a gun that was that's actually in evidence and, and was this used? Is a, this is a piece of evidence, okay. yes. The crime it was necessarily used for was uh, possession of controlled substances. Gotcha. So, I'm gonna start working it up. 
And was a round actually fired out of that? Uh, at some point? That I don't know. The only okay. thing I know is that it was involved with some type of uh, substance use. Okay. And the better, the least I know, the better it is for me to work <laughs> up the gun to keep complete bias out of the way. Absolutely. So now you get the gun in here, and where do we start? So I've already, what we usually do is a buddy check system to check whether or not there's any other um, requests for the uh, firearm, such as like a DNA or fingerprint request for it. So we've already checked to make sure that there was no other requests on it, and it's already in my custody to start working on it, so I'll start doing that. And I have to pull up my worksheets and uh, start noting down the information about it. Gotcha. So you do this with every firearm that comes into to your possession? Yes. As you can see, actually right here, I have a bunch of test fires that I was packaging up and ready to put back into the vault. Gotcha. Um, for our storage for uh, finished cases. And so obviously you're handling the weapon, you're not handling it with any gloves. Have all the fingerprint analysis to your knowledge at this point been done, or is if that what you're that That's what part the body check is okay. done. If, it, if they really wanted, because these when these guns come to the lab, they don't mm -hmm. come in any um, type of bag or um, any covered in, if they do want a fingerprint or DNA, it's usually covered up with uh, like a paper bag or in, within a plastic bag, depending okay. on what kind of case it is. Okay. So how long does it take you to go through this computer check? Uh, usually not too, too long. If it, the computer decides it wants to work with me today, which it's not. There we go. So I scan the barcode that goes along with the case. It'll pull up all the case information and all the different items of evidence that are in associated with this case, um, as well as the other assignments that are associated with the case. Gotcha. I've actually, I think, wor already worked a few guns out of this assignment while just from pulling them out of the vault and doing them day to day. And so right now you're just doing the buddy check for it. I've already done the buddy check. Okay, you've already done that. So I'm, now what are you doing? I'm pulling it? up the assignment to start working up the gun for okay. like writing the information down and leading to the test firing. Gotcha. And so we have the the IBIS assignment right here, or the Nibin assignment. And I will then check what's actually within the assignment. If it, I'm sorry, our computer system is running a bit slow today. I'm glad it happens to you <laughs> as well. So this is item nine. I want to make sure that item nine is in. So since there's already, um, since this IBIS assignment has a bunch of other um, firearms in it, and I only have this, the one particular item correlated to that uh -huh. assignment, I'm going to create a new assignment just specifically for this okay. gun within the case. So it's just so I can work it up without um, having any uh, issues with another person if they pull out the other guns that are within the case. And I'll go in through my evidence list and make sure that I click it. Click on item nine, and I'll save it. And then this will allow me to start working up. How many of these do you process a day? Um, between seven to 10 guns a day usually, or at least I try to. Um, What's the backlog in terms of number that are in the queue waiting to be processed? Uh, I would say about maybe about around five to 600 guns. I know wow. we got in about 267 of them last week. Wow. But we did put out about, I think we put out 247 cases last week, so we were kind of just breaking even with it, but uh, we're, we're trying to work to make sure that we continuously break even or get, go above the amount that we actually get in. And how many other Nibin techs are there besides yourself? Uh, just one other one. So there's two of you processing all of these guns. Yeah, but uh, we are in the process of hiring two new ones, and the examiners, if when they finish doing their casework, if they have time, they will also help us work up these guns. Wow. All right, 
So this is uh, my the matrix panel that I use to fill out the information. So it's going to ask me like who the examiner is, which is me, what the item number, the date that the gun was collected, the date I examined it, and so we'll start filling it out. With okay. And I see two two computers in here. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem to be a whole lot of other room to add some more spots. Uh, if you do hire anybody sooner, you're just gonna have to <laughs> rotate and shifts and take turns using the two computers. Uh, there's another computer in here. Okay. Um, also out there, there's a bunch of microscopes that have computers around them, and we can work out there to do gotcha. as well. But we've also had the idea of doing a rotation on someone always being on the Nibin entry, so that someone is always entering and someone and three of us are always working. Gotcha. Nine. And so you have to finish this before you can test fire the weapon. Yeah. This is very important to have done before I even shoot it, because I have to. I'll know the um, condition of the barrel. I'll make sure that there's nothing inside the barrel, that there's no um, uh, cracks along the barrel, so that it's actually safe to fire. And I'll know how dirty the barrel is as well. Now you just keep it in this condition. You don't. You don't strip it down and break it into parts to examine it, right? No, not okay. at all. Because that could, if I do that, it could, um, it could possibly uh, change the markings of the firearm as, right. as I shoot it. actually perfect for me to find where the caliber is. Okay. So I don't know if you can see it in the camera. There's an inscribe right on top of the barrel that says 5.56 five, five NATO. So that's the cal caliber of the firearm. Okay, now I'm gonna look down the barrel to make sure that there's nothing inside of it and that it's not broken. I was checking if the firearm um, was able to dry fire, which it was. And I'm not gonna do trigger pull. What happens if you get a gun that's not able to dry fire? Um, if it's not able to dry fire, I'll see if I can figure out what's causing it to not um, dry fire, um, which will possibly lead me to taking the gun apart to hopefully fix it to test fire it. Um, then that will be a reason. Or uh, we'll decide that it cannot be fired and we will just reject it and put it and put, put out a uh, notification that the gun was broken and not fired. Gotcha. Um, not in here. It, it, it'll automatically put it on. It's also on the label. That's good. I just want to make sure that we have everything that's on. Mm-hmm. I'll cut that out. Okay. And I'm going to note the safeties of the firearm. And this firearm only has one, and it's a manual safety. So the manual safety is this little... Um, switch right here, so I have it on fire, and I can switch it to safe. This is the only thing that's uh, on the firearm that's the safety. Okay. Now I'm going to create the envelope to store the test fire, so I'll note that. Um, so I'm actually going to write the HPD number on this, so I don't know if you can necessarily film this part. I have to grab, I'm gonna grab some ammunition to the ammunition to test fire this, and I think it's in. Where would you get ammunition from? Well, I mean, we seem to be in short <laughs> supply of it here. Well, this is all pistol ammunition. Oh, okay. So, so you keep all your. So this room is just totally dedicated to pistols. Yes. Right. <laughs> so we have. Uh, this is all the pistol ammunition. We have it labeled with 
45 GAP and 45 auto. Right. Um, nine millimeters, so the rifle ammunition is in this room where the okay. shooting tank is. So are you in your own personal life, are you a gun guy or is this just something that uh, is purely <laughs> academic for you? Uh, it's purely academic for me. I'm originally from New Jersey where you, oh. they don't really like you to own a gun. Gotcha. So um, I just always found it very interesting how um, a gun um, all of the tools on it leave these very like specific marks that can kind of lead back to it. So yeah. it was something very interesting for me to learn about through school and I kind of just fell into it. Right. So that gun is a semi-automatic rifle, as yeah. we noted before, it's a 5.56 NATO, yeah. also known as a 223 round. Yes. Uh, so I guess you've got that in yeah. high supply here. I just have to remember where we put most of it. I see some right here. Oh, yep, there's, right some, here. there's some Remington. You seem kind of low on the 223. There's some up here, too. Ah. <laughs> we have it all over the there place. There you go. There's a couple more right there. Yeah. All right. So we're going to take this. Now, how many bullets are you going to test fire? Uh, I'm going to shoot three of them. OK. So it's the check to delve. It's a safety precaution to check that the gun doesn't go full auto. Mm -hmm. So that way, it only shoots three rounds at once. Um, it also gives me three options to look at to test the suitability to whether or not which one I want to put into my event. Are you going to load them single shot, or are you actually going to put a put them in a magazine? Uh, well, I'm going to put them in a magazine. I have a reference magazine inside of the shooting room that I'll gotcha. put it in. So I have Remington ammunition. These are Full Metal Jackets, and it's brass, brass, fancy for. What's that fancy little tool? What? What's that tool? This is, um, it, it, I use this to uh, scribe on the cartridge case and the bullet of the uh, forensic lab number and the um, sub item number that I'm going to give it. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to do that in a second. I just like to put a mark on it, on them first before I do that. might be a little loud. So I engraved the forensic lab number as well as the sub item number on it so that after I test fire them and they're separated, I can match them back up to each other. So wait a second, you wrote the numbers with that device? Yes. On there? That takes the skill in and of itself. I wrote it both on the cartridge case and on the bullet. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> How much practice did you have to do for that? Uh, it took about six months to get it down to make it neatly. <laughs> <laughs> where people could actually yeah. read it. <laughs> Took a little bit. Um, so I'm going to note what kind of, how many cartridges I'm going to test fire, um, that it's stock ammunition that I'm using and not evidence ammunition, um, the brand of ammunition that I'm using, and the sub item number 
of it. Which is that. Get him. I also know that I'm using a reference magazine to test fire um, the firearm. And okay, Let's save that. Now, before we go in there, what does the test? What does the test fire actually do? What's the purpose of the test fire? What's it going to tell you on on these uh, three bullets? So the purpose of the test fire is to pretty much create a cartridge that has the markings from the firearm. So I'm essentially only going to be using the cartridge case, so I'll have uh, what we call the breech face marks and the firing pin mark that'll be entered into the system, which it uses to compare across a database of images that have been collecting um, within our parameters that uh, is set for us to search within. And for our viewers who don't have firearms, don't really understand firearms, yeah. don't deal with them on a regular basis, each firearm has markings that are consistent with that firearm, right? Yes. Um, so talk about how how that is and what you're looking for in each of those. Okay, so we when talked I, about the firing pin yeah. and the breech markings. Yeah, so the breech face is um, what I'm referring to. There's a circular bolt right here. There is a, um, a, la a, not a, lever, a layer. Uh, it's the firing, uh, the cartridge case sits right on this like surface here that's held in place. So when it's shot and the triggers pull, a firing pin will come through the hole that's on that panel and strike the primer, which will hit the inner circle here and it'll leave a mark. Um, and then the pressure from the explosion from uh, the firing process will cause the cartridge case to be pushed against the breech face over here, leaving the impressions that are marked on the breech face on the cartridge case. And we use those to um, you uh, in the Niven system to uh, search for similarities within it. All right, well, let's go fire it up. All right. So now we're in the firing room, right? Yes, I need to go get my protective gear. I'm going to get you guys some. Great. Uh, can we just kind of, can you explain for us what oh, all this sure. is before we put it on? This is the uh, water tank. Yep. So essentially what I'll do is I'll put the, point the barrel down into the water tank and the water will essentially stop the bullet and allow us to have a full, uh, fully intact bullet to examine if needed later. But um, what I found with the 223 or the 5.56 NATO is when you shoot it into the water, it actually kind of completely fragments and we don't get the full bullet because of how small it is and how fast it's actually going. Now, is this just regular tap water or do you guys do something special to no, it? No, just regular water. It is, it is uh, filled with lead from being fired in sure. so many times. <laughs> so that's, I guess that's something special with it. But you, other than that, How often do you have to clean it out? I mean, does, does, does the water being filled with lead, does that affect the test at all? Uh, no, not at all. Um, we filter it out. There's a, we have a filter system that runs through it. Um, I we haven't cleaned it out in a bit, but we need, actually need to clean it out. All right, good enough. Well, let's get our headgear on yeah. and go to town. <laughs> All right. Excuse me. shoot me like I have to warn everybody out here that I'm going to fire. Oh yeah. This is what we will. He's got to stick his head on the hallway. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to get the water can. Preparing to fire. So I'm going to take this and switch it to firing so no one comes in here. Got to shut this door. Yeah. You guys you guys need to be on this side. Can I be in here with you like 
Yes, you can be right there. You just can't be in front of me. So then I'll take the cartridges, I'll load them in here. Is there anything special about the test magazine? No, it's just a magazine that we have. These The rifles don't always come with magazines with them to test fire them. Right. It's a little bit easier to test fire with a magazine. So then I won't put them in or point the gun anywhere that's not safe until I'm over here. Everybody good? Everybody got their ears and eyes on? Okay. Ready, fire! Firing! And that's test firing. Pick up my cartridge cases. Put them back in the envelope that I created for them. Put them over here. And turn everything back off. If you want, you can take a look inside the tank and see what the bullets look like. You're good, all right, awesome. <laughs> Most of them I think have completely fragmented and, oh, we got one that's actually still intact. Cool. We got a couple, all right. I'm gonna turn that on. And we have a, a vacuum system. It's essentially this big tube here and I can just suck them up. If I turn on the vacuum. <laughs> Uh, they're in the envelope that I put over there. I picked gotcha. them off the ground already. Okay. And then I'll put these in the envelope with the casings. If you want to see these real quick, this is how they come out after I'm done test firing them. And see how they still have my inscription still on them, too. Oh, yeah. Some handy work right there. Yeah. <laughs> put them back in here. I will put a zip tie through this, show that it's safe to handle and that it's not loaded. And then we'll take it back outside and finish up the worksheet. And then uh, and we'll do the uh, evaluation and entering. Great. So essentially I do that, I'll do that for each one of these rifles, but I usually go in and I shoot all of them at once. 
And do you do the actual analysis of the casings and the bullet? Uh, I don't do anything with the bullet. If anything, the examiners do the do stuff with the bullet. I only work with the cartridge case. So what I'll do is I'll take them and I'll go evaluate them on the comparison scope, mm -hmm. decide which one is the best um, representation of the firearm, and I'll put that into the Niven system. And then you'll pass it off to the next person to do the actual analysis. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So after test firing, I'm going to head over the comparison microscope to check the suitability of my test fires and see which one I'm going to submit into Niven. So we're going to go over this way. This one right here. We'll see how the lighting looks when I get to look through it. Tell, narrate this, huh? So I'm taking each <clears throat> cartridge case, I'm going to put it on the stage holders so that I can view them um, side by side. First, we'll probably have to adjust the height of it because. Yeah. Okay. So I'm moving the cartridge cases into fo into view on the stage. Markings that would be useful um, to use in the Niven system. And I'm looking at the test fires that I created, seeing which one uh, came out the best. There's the other one. Oops, sorry. Marker real quick. I'm going to mark the extractor position on it so that I can have it the orientation when I put it into the Niven system because the Niven system requires them to be put in a certain way. Okay. So I'm going to put this casing into the Niven system for analysis. And that's the process with the comparison microscope. So we'll head over to the entry system. So we're heading over to the imaging system. Uh, the imaging system is called Brass Tracks. So it'll essentially take a 2D and 3D image of the cartridge cases. And this is the Brass Tracks system. And I will log in to the database via this computer. We get a good shot of there, and can you show the viewers what we were talking about before in terms of the markings oh, on there? Yes. Um, so this little circular mark that's now inside of the primer is the f uh, the firing pin mark, and when we put it up on the screen, it'll give a bigger image to allow you guys to see it better. But we'll see the breech face marks of just a, a few markings left behind from the breech face on the cartridge case. And those are the main markings that you're talking about. There's no other markings on the side of the casing or anything that you'd use as a reference point. Not full. Well, I use the um, the extractor mark as a reference point. That's what this green mark is mm -hmm. to note where the extractor is. It's underneath the lip of the cartridge case. Um, so that's where the uh, firearm grabs it and pulls it out of the chamber and then it'll hit an ejector which will fling it out of the um, firearm. That's why they kind of like shoot out of the firearm. <clears throat> so now I'm going to put in the case information, the basic case information that I have, like the case, no the forensic lab number. Um, oh wait, I already made a case under this lab number, so I just have to go and find it now. Actually, you hearing him? Yes. So IBIS tracks. There, it's kind of the standard for the industry in terms of analyzing Brass. this. Yes, brass tracks is actually put out by. Um, the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms, Tobacco, and Explosives. Mm -hmm. So they own pretty much all the equipment that's over here, hmm. and they lend it to us to use. So we use their system and their database to do our examinations. OK. Uh, the make of the ammunition I used to test fire it, which is Remington. 
um, the firing pin shape, which is important for the search parameters, um, so that it'll only give me firing pins that are shaped circular, which is what the uh, firing pin shape is on this uh, test fire. Put the composition of the ammunition, um, the category of the case, as well as the uh, number item that it's associated with. Clarity on that thing's amazing. Yeah, it's really good. And what I'll do now is I'll center it in the in the middle of the screen. I'll check it under different lightings to see if there's any markings that I missed under the scope that I can maybe see here. It's like a Google Maps of a bullet. Mm -hmm. And then I'll hit continue. And that's it. The system is fully automated. It takes about five to eight minutes for it to acquire the image. And I sit here and wait for it to finish acquiring it. Now that's the casing. Do you do you put the bullet through the tip through the same process? Uh, there is a system that they come at, came out with called Bullet Tracks, um, mm -hmm. but we don't use it. Uh, there's not enough within the database to actually use the mm. Bullet Track okay. system. If you're sitting at home on a Saturday night and you see something come on the news about a crime and a firearm being used, do you ever think to yourself, "Man, am I going to get to look Some, at that firearm?" Sometimes, <laughs> 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 but. Um, but you really don't know, other than yeah. just a general description. Like this, this one was from a drug case. Yeah, you don't know specifically where it occurred, or when it occurred, or anything like that. Well, right? I know it occurred within the twenty fourth of April. Sure, that's all I know. But, but you don't know like what block of what street or oh, anything yeah, like no. that. Like, yeah. if you want, I can go in and show you the vault. How many guns we have right now? That I, <laughs> I take your word for. It. <laughs> but yeah, so. What's, uh, what I think is really interesting about the system is it gives both a 2D and a 3D image. So when it comes back, I can take like an image of this and I'll be able to move it around and twist it so I can even see the inner, the like um, inside of what the primer looks like after the really? primer came through. Yeah. So when this is done, wow. I can actually show you what that looks like. It just might take like a little bit for it to do that. But yeah. I, I think it's one of the most like the best tools that we have within the firearms field to do this. So is this equipment actually, owned? you said it was owned by the federal government. Yeah. Is it through ATF? Yeah, uh, we work, they, ATF works with a company called um, Forensic Technology Industries and they are the ones who kind of like produce this. The ATF kind of maintains everything. Mm -hmm. We use their, the a ATF runs the database of Niven and it's like all run through them. So you have to get permission to use it. I have to get I had to get special clearance and special permission to even be logged into the system. I was given a special code and password and all this other stuff to even get logged in. Wow. Yeah. Super high clearance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the coolest thing I got. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So like uh, we're not even allowed to move this stuff. If we want to move it, so we have to call in a uh, specialized tech to come in and do it for us. Even if somebody like spills a drink? You don't want to do that either. Nope. <laughs> I, yeah, I noticed no beverages are yeah. there. <laughs> it's, it's Although all, I don't see a sign that says keep all beverages away. It's kind of common knowledge. It's We don't own it. We don't want to break it. Right. They're super expensive. What did our parents used to tell us? You break it, you own it? Yeah. <laughs> so now... Imagine the, this stuff's pretty expensive to own. Yeah. It is. Hmm. Usually while it's doing this, I usually have a set of other test fires and I'll put in the other information for the other gun and the other uh, test fire that I put in. And by the time I completely do that, this is finished doing whatever it's doing. Hmm. I'm ready to submit it in. I think they'll need a petition for faster internet around here. This isn't the internet, this is just the acquisition no, this process. this is just the acquisition, okay. 
and I, I'd prefer it to take its time. <laughs> like in the other room, yeah, I would prefer to have quicker internet, but we're working on it. So this is just actually the time that it takes for the computer itself to process the image. Yeah, to take all the images, it takes it at different angles and different lighting. Um, it's like said to give like topographical mm. information on it. So like we'll have gray, we'll have a gray and black scale where the gray is the like surface and the black is the divots that you see on the on the casing. But it's mainly just the primer and the firing pin, and that's where the breech face and the firing pin mark is. It's just gonna do the last one of the full head stamp, and then it'll be finished. What would you say is the most exciting thing for you personally about your job? Uh, test firing the guns. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went from like never firing a gun to shoot. I've at this point I've shot over three hundred guns now, like since I started working. So here, uh, I originally worked in Virginia, mm -hmm. and from there mm -hmm. I fired about one hundred and fifty, and then starting here I have gone surpass that at this point. <laughs> and from, from a, just an intellectual standpoint, what's the most interesting thing about your job? Uh, I would have to say like this whole, this whole process as well as the comparison on the uh, match point system is just like how the tooling, the manufacturing and the tooling process on all of these guns and how it creates these patterns that like stay very unique to that one firearm. Um, and it's just, it's crazy how some of these things just match back up. Yeah, like I think people up. don't really realize that that each gun almost has a unique set of fingerprints in a way. Exactly. And you can identify a, a specific firearm based upon the markings that it leaves on a bullet. Exactly. So uh, this is the 3D image that I was telling you about. Mm. So what I can do is I can turn it like this, and give it a different lighting and different angles, and I can even flip it around to see the wow. firing pin mark and even show the inside of the primer. And then on the other system where we do the, they do the evaluations of the side-by-side -side images is you can even change the color. Of, you can make it brass, you can make it green, you can make it blue. There's a black filter on it that helps um, with, at certain angles, the lighting when it hits it, it gives you like completely different marks to look at. So right now I have these bl this blue and red circle. Um, I'm mainly trying to encompass the breech face, uh, so the, anything that's between the blue and the red circle will be considered for um, like uh, scaling when it goes through the algorithm, and then just the blue circles just for the firing pin. And then I will hit the submit button, and it's done. So are we done with your process? We're done with my process. And now where do we go? Now we hand it off to my manager, Donna. All right, we're back in my favorite room, the wall of ammo. We've got Donna Udaly and Dr. Stout have joined us. And uh, Donna, explain for the viewers what your role here is at the Houston Forensic Science Center. I'm the manager of the firearms section. So I'm responsible for technical decisions, managing budget, uh, making decisions about workflows, and things like that. So we just saw in the hallway, Joe, uh, pass the casings off to you. From from there, where do you take it and what do you do with it? Um, I don't really do anything with <laughs> evidence anymore. Uh, my role is to just support my team and make sure that they have all the resources that they need. Gotcha. And uh, Dr. Stout, I know you have a lot of, we, we talked a little bit before at the beginning of the show about wanting to get out of this building. We see yep. uh, at, at earlier in the show we saw how you know, we've got two techs in this room. Yep. Uh, we've got two computers. If we bring more on, yep. uh, we're going to have some space problems. Yep, here. we have space problems. It's it's facility is a real challenge for us because we've got places where we're stacked on top of each other like this. We've got other places that the configuration we just can't use, and it's expensive to reconfigure it. This is an old building that we want out of, so it's not worth spending the money on that. 
but we have difficulties in this building of inadequate power capacity that limits what we can do in terms of putting in new equipment, uh, changing out equipment. So there's, there's a lot of challenges in this building that really we need to get to new facility for. And question for both of y'all. I mean, you have two Nibin techs who are going through a massive amount of firearms. Yep. Uh, there's a backlog. There is. And uh, hey, Joe told us about that. Um, what's the concern on y'all's end with the number of firearms and only having two technicians to get through those firearms? Well, you know, from kind of the, the global standpoint, what we've seen over the four years that HFSC has existed is the number of requests for Nibin processing has doubled. Um, four years ago it was about 200 a month, now it's about 400 a month. Um, so the issue of backlogs, whether it's in biology or latent prints or firearms, is one that I'm trying a lot of ways to help people understand it's a recurrent issue. Uh, it is, yes, we can put resources towards it, yes, we can work on workflow, yes, we can do you know, the things that we need to be doing, but you get a hurricane or you get a freeze, we lose a week of production, and that lost week of production will rattle on for a month, if not two months. We have changes in chemistries that happen, or we have something that's new knowledge that's shown up that now causes us to go back and look at old cases. Well, those audits of old cases consume resources that we now don't have to do current cases. And there's always something like that that shows up. So in the case of Nibin and what's happened in that backlog, it's relatively small, it's relatively recent, but we had a staff changing. We, we actually it was a promotional opportunity that Donna could step into being the manager, but in the time that it takes to get a new Nibin tech in, get them trained, get them where they're proficient in doing the quality of work that we're looking for, that time lag with the increasing workflow ends up with a backlog. Donna, as the manager, what's the biggest stressor for you? Just making sure that my staff has the resources with a limited budget, limited manpower, limited time. Um, there's a lot of deadlines that we have to meet as far as um, assessment the uh, ISO accreditation assessments that are coming up, internal deadlines that are happening, and so I just have to try to make sure my staff is somewhat buffered from all of the, the external challenges and make sure they can focus on getting good quality work in a timely manner for our, our stakeholders, our customers. And, and you talk about your customers. I mean, your customers are the police, the district attorney's office, and to some degree, the defense bar as well. And the, and the um, public in general. Right, and uh, I, I'm assuming that you do most, run most of the interference between um, your techs and and the public at large and the, and the stakeholders in this, in this whole process, right? Yes, myself and the case manager and other supervisor in the section. How, how often do you have to, do you get a disgruntled police officer or assistant district attorney or somebody else calling saying, where is that, uh, where is that report? Where is that evidence analysis? How often do you have to deal with that on a weekly basis? Not very often, really. Um, we try to maintain some constant, con if something is going to take longer than it, we expect it to, we maintain contact with whoever requested that, that analysis so that they understand why it's taking longer. And the end result is a good quality work that they know they can rely on for investigations, for courts. And so it may take longer, but in the end, they're happy with the results. Um, same thing with, with court and same thing with NIBIN. Um, if somebody needs something prioritized, then we move that to the front of the line because we know that most of the guns that we handle aren't high priority. And so when we get something that investigators haven't identified as a high priority firearm, we will move that to the front of the line and, and do that first. I'm gonna put you on the spot here for a little bit. What's your wish list for what you wanna see around here? <laughs> <laughs> this guy here. Um, more space, more money, more <laughs> training. <laughs> Um, you know, we have a limit, we've had a stagnant budget, budget for several years, and so if we could have a money tree, that would be great, that we could um, have more training for our staff. Peter, I know you had some social thoughts you wanted to share with our viewers on things, and uh, why don't you go ahead and let Yeah, so we talk about... Let us know your thoughts. Yeah, turnaround time, and you know, I'm on the um, Mayor's Gun Violence Commission. You know, this, what the laboratories line in that is, is relatively small. I mean, I'm, I'm a toxicologist, I'm a forensic science nerd. I'm not smart enough to answer some of those big questions of you know, how do we deal with gun violence and gun control and those types of things. But I do think for the laboratory, 
we've got a role in this of how do we get the result around faster because that then allows the existing regulations that are out there to operate more effectively. Um, our NIBIN turnaround time right now is about 53 days in total. It's about 48 hours on fired evidence. But in my opinion, that's about 51 days too long um, to really be effective and allow for investigators in the process to actually enforce those rules that exist. We need to get those results out there quicker. They need to be able to trust those results. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress on finding efficiencies within the system that we can Right now we're, we're recruiting for two more NIBIN techs, which I think will take us a long way towards being able to do everything within 24 to 48 hours. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do on a lot of different things. Um, but it is, how do we get those results back around quickly enough for the system? Um, and I, I understand, I've talked with Chief Acevedo a lot about this, of that allows them to investigate crimes that right now may be somebody that is a, a lower level crime, but that weapon and that person may ultimately end up in a more severe crime. How do we, how do we break that cycle before those things happen? And a good chunk of that is, as I saw on a lot with the staff, is the right answer at the right time. The right answer late is a little bit of frustration to most of the system. It's really no better than the wrong answer on time. Neither one of those really work for everybody and the citizens of the, of the city. Well, what I'm impressed by is the fact that you even let us in here in the first place. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the, trans, the level of transparency that you guys have provided to us, uh, not just by coming on the show last year, but the show we did uh, just a couple weeks ago and now letting us come on site with cameras, with our, with our team, and talk to your people and see how the process is done. Uh, it's just been amazing. I, I, I really commend you guys for the, the transparency that you're bringing to the process and, and letting us in and letting us see what it's all about. Appreciate that. I mean, we'd like Sam. I'm, I'm really pleased with the progress we've been able to make. We've come a long way. We still have a lot of work to do. It's not, we still have backlogs. We still have processes that need to be improved. We still have things that need to get better. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll keep working on it. I, you know, it's, it's very gratifying work because what we do really affects people's lives and livelihoods. I think the staff have a real commitment to that. Well, you can um, see that. I mean, it, it, clearly, the people around here are passionate about the work that yeah. they do. So it's it's a good group of people. I, I wish I could do more for them. Uh, you know, I keep Everybody trying to get, does, right? Yeah, I keep trying to figure out ways that I can do better for them. You know, there's places where, you know, I screw up stuff. I don't get stuff done right for them. kills me when that happens. But you know, we, we keep, the solution isn't quit. We've got to keep trying, even if budgets are tight. That doesn't mean stop trying. That just means we've got to be smarter about how we figure out how to do this. Yeah. Well, I really want to thank you all, Ken, for letting us come into your place of business and see how this whole process goes down. It's just, it's been an amazing day here uh, at y'all's facility, and we appreciate it, and thank you for letting us in. All right. Welcome. All right. Appreciate it. Appreciate thank it. You. Well, it was really great being able to spend the day at the Houston Forensic Science Center. I hope you all learned as much as I did about the process of analyzing firearms, test shooting firearms, and really seeing the transparency that this agency has put forth since the old Houston Crime Lab. We're going to hopefully have another show with these guys coming up in the very soon. I don't know the exact date yet, but we're going to have one final show with them. So if you have any questions or comments about tonight's show, hit us up on Facebook, hit us up on Twitter, and we'll get your questions answered the next time we have Dr. Stout in the studio. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you on the next episode of Reasonable Doubt.